You can go ahead. Okay, I'm just pulling up, pulling up my notes. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. We're reading book three. Sutra 2, and this is from the translation from Satchitananda. Yesterday we talked about Dharna, which is concentration. We're getting into the last three realms of the um, Elam practice. So Dhyana is the continuous flow of cognition towards an object. The Hindu scriptures give a beautiful example of this continuous flow. They say it is like pouring oil from one pot into another. It is continuous string. It doesn't break. The mind is fixed. Communication between meditator and object of meditation is steady. That's what's called dhyana. Normally what we are doing when we say we are meditating is dharna. After a long practice of dharna, Gradually, the flow of cognition gets a little longer and it becomes dhyana. When would you know that you have really meditated? There are some signs for that. Say you come and sit for meditation at 4.30. Meditation is signed for an hour. The bell rings at 5.30. If you feel, what, who rang the bell this soon? I just sat down five minutes ago. Then you may have been meditating. But when you feel five minutes as one hour, you are not meditating. You are still concentrating. Time has no meaning in meditation and space is also lost. You don't know where you are. If you break that meditation, all of a sudden you may wonder, what happened to my body? Even the body is forgotten in real meditation. You are above time and space. You are out of the body. When I say out of the body, don't think I mean that you are traveling in space or anything like that. I mean the mind transcends body consciousness. In this sense, meditation is similar to sleep. You don't know you have a body. Even though you still have it, you don't know it. If your sleep is really deep and someone comes and takes your body somewhere else, you don't even know. When you wake up, you will say, I was sleeping on the couch, who brought me to the bed? There are other signs of meditation also. In the beginning, you feel so light when you transcend the body. Sometimes you get beautiful visions connected with the object of your meditation are sometimes not connected, but something beautiful and elevating. Sometimes you won't see visions. You will simply see beautiful light. You will seem to be bathed in beautiful moonlight, or sometimes you may just hear beautiful sounds like the roaring of the ocean, the sound of the gong, or the beautiful notes of a flute. These are all very <coughs> Normally I don't say these things much because once you hear that, you may imagine that it is happening to you instead that it just should happen. So Swami Gyanasvara translates the repeated continuation or uninterrupted stream of that one point of focus is called absorption in meditation and is the seventh of the eight steps. The repeated concentration on one object of concentration is meditation. Typically, there is a moment of concentration when there are no distractions. Then a moment later, a distraction comes. Then attention lets go of the distraction and returns to the object of concentration. However, when that distraction does not happen, the continued concentration on the one object is called meditation. And yesterday, we were talking about the systematic moving inward of pratyahara, and I think that definitely relates to this. When you finally start hitting those deeper layers of awareness, then the other ones just fall away. So you don't get distracted because you're absorbed in something else. When the same object repeatedly comes, another way of describing the process of meditation is that there is an ongoing series of individual concentrations rather than one continuous concentration. It, if each of those concentrations is on the same object, that is called meditation. Whether you prefer to think of it as one continuous flow of concentration 
or a series of individual concentrations on the same object it is the unbroken or undistracted characteristic of attention that allows concentration to evolve into meditation. With meditation, there is still an observer observing and observed. When the observer becomes extremely absorbed in the process of observing the object, the three collapse in such that there is only awareness of the object. This is when meditation becomes samadhi. Meditation, along with concentration and samadhi, is a tool for examining the inner world so as to experience the center of consciousness. Gross objects and subtle objects are systematically experienced, examined, and set aside with non-attachment, gradually moving past the layers of ignorance or avidya. Um, and the, the type of meditation I was taught, there are 50 different gross and subtle objects you're supposed to meditate through. Eventually, you meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate to the point where then you, then you meditate without an object. I think we talked about this in earlier sutras, Asim Prajnata, right? You, you're able to transcend thought forms, you transcend attachments, and you're able to meditate without having to focus on an external thing. So, so yeah, this is, I mean, what he, he kind of covered everything. This is something I always tell students, you think you were probably meditating, but you know, a lot of traditions just keep you in concentration the whole time. Um, and the yogis teach this path, which is very systematic and very scientific. And meditation is something that is a little further along than concentration. Concentration is equally valuable because you can't get to meditation until you master concentration, but it is for sure not the same exact thing. Any comments, any impressions? If so, you can unmute yourselves. I definitely related to the first part where he says, um, if you feel like five minutes feels like an hour. <laughs> yeah. At first, it definitely does feel like that when you sit down or when you sit down to try to meditate um just like the rushing it's it's strange how your concept of time when your mind is just when you're just sitting alone with your mind not doing anything how much slower everything moves but then i've had the other experience too where i've gone in like a flotation tank like the uh, sensory deprivation tank you're in there for 90 minutes, but you're like, no way. By the time I come out, I feel like there's no way I've been in there for 90 minutes, but I look at the clock and I've been in there for 90 minutes. So there's both. It's very interesting how like you can manipulate time by like manipulating your senses. Well, because the sense time is just perceived through the sense. Yeah. Like we're not perceiving time as it actually is at all. That's what, that's what gets really trippy, right? That's so true. Like when he's talking about that moment where the observed and the observer and the observation all collapse into one, it's like you, you have this moment where you're like, nothing is real. <laughs> time, time is not real. Yeah, that's a, that's a crazy realization to have. And quantum physics teaches that too, that it's not linear the way that we think it is. Like nothing was the way that we thought it was. And that's a lot of what, I feel like that's what, a lot of what being a transcendentalist is about. Transcending all those false impressions that have been handed down to us and taught to us by our senses, by our external senses. It's like, we're so in illusion, we're so in Maya. And then as you start to do these practices, it breaks down, all the illusion breaks down. 
It's crazy. Yeah. And this isn't funny. Like when I, when I first start, so the first day of teacher training and it's usually like four months, they make everybody sit for 20 minutes. We're going to sit and meditate. And everybody, the first day is like, what? We have to sit here for 20 minutes. Jesus. <laughs> terrible and then they come out of it and I'm like what were your impressions like my leg felt like it was gonna fall off I can't concentrate that was so long it felt like three hours and then by the end of the four months they're like begging to sit for meditation because it's such a different experience when you start hitting these points of um of actual meditation practice right it doesn't feel like a long time it feels really good and it's something that you crave to kind of like check out of the illusion yeah, and by the end, I remember by the end of teacher training, like the twenty minutes feels like no time at all. Yeah, right. Yeah, it goes by so fast. Yeah, they open their eyes and like that's it. That was for time for twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, your little chime goes off on your phone. It's like we're done. <laughs> yeah, and that you have to use a timer eventually because you know there have been days where I would you've been meditating with a friend who's a very elevated person every time i meditate with her it get real trippy really fast if we didn't set a timer we'd be sitting there for like two hours and we would come out of it and like miss things because you like lose track of all time it's really crazy yesterday i i was on our garage roof picking mulberries and just singing mantras and i came in i mean granted i got a bowl like this but I came in, I go, Pierre, look at this. He goes, yeah, you've been up there for over an hour. And I was like, no way. In my head, it was like, you know, 20 minutes went by. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't paying attention to anything except each little mulberry. <laughs> is it mulberry season already? Yeah, this tree is like loaded. Is you have black mulberries? Yeah. It's still, I think I gave you a, I gave you a branch, no? It died. But I have a white one that randomly showed up. That's okay, probably. so I'll get you a branch. I'll get you a branch. He has, he cut more branches. Thank you. My neighbors cut down all of our trees. I won't Oh, they, no. They, they went down with um, the trees between the property. They cut them Wait, down. they cut it? Yeah. Oh. Well, this is in my neighbor's backyard, and I keep praying that they never, ever touch it. Yeah, that's a good tree to have. Make things fun. So yeah, I think that speaks to, but like, okay, so sometimes people will be like, oh, I was meditating or like I was playing the piano and I was meditating. I think that that's more of, um, that's like the precursor to meditation, right? You couldn't even see the mulberries. If you were meditating. If you right? were meditating, yeah. Yeah, but like you can't get to that point. It was more. You can get the mulberries for an hour and not realize an hour has gone by. It's like, it was more concentration. Space. Yeah. But like it's so important. You, A lot of people can't do that. They can't focus on something for an hour right now, right? They lose interest and have to go inside and look at Facebook or something. Concentration, I think right now is something that's just so, so hard for people because of the way that we're just like always stimulated. Our senses are always stimulated with the technology. It's just all day long. And it's, I think concentration is something, I, I feel like that's why a lot of people are gravitating towards yoga and towards trying to meditate because it's so necessary now that we're, we've sunk so deep into the illusion of being stimulated all the time especially like for like adults, like I know like a lot of my coworkers and stuff will ask me about like meditating, like how to meditate and like how to practice. And I, I tell them the same thing that you told us, how basically like your practice is in concentrating. It's not really meditating at this point because what your issue is because, you know, they, we work in the city, you know, our, our, our our life is very fast paced. Like we have like daily deadlines and stuff. We, and we're on the computer all day and like reading, you know, stuff online all day. And I'm like, yeah. So the practice that you need to work on is like tuning out of that and just being able to concentrate on one thing at a time. And there's so many, like when you do a job application, they'll, a lot of the times in this industry, especially it'll be, you know, multitasking will be on that on like the job description but i so i have to explain to people all the time that like 
sure, multitasking might be good from a business perspective, but from a personal perspective, you're frying your brain <laughs> and your nervous system. So it, like the best way to practice it in the beginning, if you can, because they'll come to me and say that they can't sit down and like sit still for like five minutes. So I'm like, if you can find just one thing to just concentrate on, then that is where you can begin a practice because it might be too much to sit there and try to make your mind quiet or make it focus on one thing, even just your breathing. It might, that's just, that might just be too much. Yeah. Like in the beginning phases, especially with the way things are now. Yeah, things are really hyper-stimulating now. I was listening to a talk on the Bhagavatam this week and it was talking about how the reason why we have all these yamas and niyamas and we have all these sort of rules that we subscribe to as yogis is because getting to that place of concentration requires that we let go of our attachment to the senses. You can't, you can't concentrate if you're addicted to all the sense gratification of the world and you can't master the mind to get to a point of concentration unless you let go of that. But the, the thing that causes the most suffering isn't necessarily the, how did the quote go? It's, like the, um, it's not necessarily your karma or the planets or the people that you live around. It's your mind that's causing the most suffering because of its perception of things. And all that is addiction and aversion. It's like we're stuck in that cycle of going back and forth, back and forth to the point where we can't focus on a thing for long enough that we can absorb our minds into it. So yeah, it's a, it's a really big, it's a big hard thing to overcome. And I think a lot of people are really scared to go there, rightfully so. Yeah. It's interesting how they still crave that though. Like even being afraid to do it, yeah. there's like some deeper understanding in so many people that like it's needed. <laughs> Usually at a point of suffering. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, how long do you have to be totally sick of the material world before you say, all right, I need something different. And that's usually when people end up coming to yoga and meditation. They're like, nothing else is working. Yeah. I've gotten all the things. I'm still not satisfied. I still don't have peace. I've been to all the specialists. I still have pain. I still have discomfort. I still have anxiety. I still have depression. Right? The whole list goes on and on and on. The human is capable of a lot of discomfort and suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's like you finally turn towards, and I guess that's sort of the purpose of it, right? Like we have to it's almost like you have to go through all the awfulness to get to the point where you don't want to participate with it anymore. Like it serves a, it serves a purpose. Definitely. Though, yeah. It seems like needless and terrible sometimes, but it serves a purpose. I've been thinking about that recently on my talk last night um, for my class was, I can't, I can never remember the Sanskrit. It's like, um, or I, I can't remember the whole thing, but the, the idea of this particular mantra, and it's not to be insensitive to the moment, it's not about spiritually bypassing, it's about, it's about a reminder to like keep us going on the path of what we have to do. It's, this is perfect, that is perfect, all is perfect. If we think that what we see is happening is not perfect, it's not like some higher design, it's because we're not aware it's like we've we've um, forgotten, we've forgotten that there's a bigger picture there, and all this is for is actually perfect. And I have to keep coming back to that in this moment because everything seems so not perfect, and that's my own um, ignorance. Like this, all of this terribleness could be leading to this great awakening that's causing freedom for millions of people, right? But like I'm so in my limited perceptive experience of my addiction um to whatever and my aversion to a lot of different things going on right now that i can't see past past the own suffering of my little tiny mind so it's like you come back to that idea of no actually this is perfect and like those things those sayings those um teachings of the yoga it's meant to get us out of this space so we can we can concentrate <laughs> enough to meditate. It's like all of it is a part of the system for a reason. 
And I guess you could weaponize these ideas and really like use them to spiritually bypass. But I think the underlying essence of these ideas is meant to get us to a place where we are incapable of bypassing any of those things because they avoid inherent truths that once you get to that place of deep connection to yourself, it's like you can't ignore that every other being on this planet has that same beautiful part of them. And that means that they should be treated as a precious thing, right? It's like, it, I keep thinking what you said during that um, talk, Ashley, it's been ringing in my head constantly that like, if we are all one, then if one part of the whole is getting messed with, <laughs> you're gonna say, hey, something's wrong and try to fix that. I keep thinking about that over and over again. It's like so beautiful, it's such a beautiful. Yeah, I've been thinking about a lot of that a lot too because I told you like I'm going through those experiences with my work and with my friend and it's just like when you are deeply connected to yourself you feel deeply connected to others as though they are yourself and that means that you feel their pain and that means you can't not address it yeah absolutely you should list that as one of the side effects too the intense empathy that comes when you start meditating. You become so empathic, right? Yeah. So like someone can't even walk into the room without you feeling their feelings. They don't have to say anything. <laughs> They'll be like, I couldn't say anything. <laughs> well, I can feel you, your anxiety. And your <laughs> you start to feel other people's thoughts. It's a weird, I don't know. I guess we'll get into that. I only, I only read this chapter once a long time ago, maybe almost like 17 years ago, I think I read this chapter. And when I read it, I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, none of this must be true. That's like, that was my. <laughs> but then slowly stuff starts coming to um, the forefront. And you're like, oh, hmm. there's, there's some of this yoga stuff. Any other impressions of this? Should I read on? We're at 7.55. So I'll read the last, the last rung. It's not too long. Samadhi is the same meditation when there is shining of the object alone as if devoid of form. There is not much I can say about this one. You will easily understand when you have a little experience. Meditation culminates in a state of samadhi. It's not that you practice samadhi. Nobody can consciously practice samadhi. Our effort is there only up to meditation. You put all your effort into dharna. It becomes effortless in dhyana. And you are just there knowing that you are in meditation. But in samadhi, you don't even know that. You are not there to know, because, know it because you are that. You think first with a lot of interruptions. That is dharna. Then when you become what you think, that is samadhi. In meditation, you have three things, meditator, the meditation, and the object meditated upon. In samadhi, there's neither the object nor the meditator. There's no feeling of I am meditating on that. To give scientific analogy, if you keep on adding drops of alkaline solution to an acid, at one point, the solution becomes alkaline. At that point, you're simply adding alkali to alkali. There's no more acid there. The giver and receiver become one. Earlier, the receiver was an acid head and the giver was alkali. As you add the alkali drop by drop and keep testing it with your litmus paper, at what point, all of a sudden, you notice you are no longer an acid head. Who are you? The same alkali as your word. You and he become one. That's samadhi. It's rather difficult to put into words. If you just keep working, you will know what samadhi is. Of course, there are different lower samadhis, as we talked about in the first chapter, where you attain that level and then come back. These are samadhis connected with form, with idea, with bliss, and with pure ego. Savitarka, Savichara, Sa Ananda, and Sa Asmita samadhis. All these four still leave some parts of the mind with hidden desires. You're not completely free. The ideas in the mind are not completely roasted. They could still germinate again. That's why all these four are called sabja samadhi. Bija means seed. They are with seed. Don't think you're all clean and everything is okay. As long as you are in the bag, you seem to be innocent. But the minute you take one seed out, dig a little hole, 
put it in and pour a little water, then up it comes again. The sprouting tendency is still there. As long as you have that tendency, you are still in the sabja or savikalpa samadhi. But once you get completely roasted, even that germinating capacity goes away. The seeds are still there in all external experience. They are the same, but even if they are put into holes in water, they won't germinate. What does this mean? All the thoughts, all the desires become selfless. Selfishness is the germ that sprouts saying, I want it. When the selfishness is completely taken out, you become germless. That is called nirbija samadhi or nirvikalpa samadhi. One who has achieved this may look similar to anyone else, but the burnt nature of his or her mental seeds is the difference between ordinary people and the jiva muktas, liberated beings. They also eat, sleep, and do everything like everybody else. They may be doing anything, but they are not affected by what they do. There's no moisture of attachment to cause sprouting. They are living, liberated people. Liberation is not something you experience when you die. While living, you should be liberated. Jivan mukta. Mukta means liberated. Jivan while living. That is the final state of samadhi. It is not sitting stiffly with eyes closed, as some people think. If sitting like a statue is what you call samadhi, all the rocks in the garden must be in deep samadhi. No, you will be useful. You will be active, more active than other people. Your actions are more perfect than other people's. You are dynamic, but you look static. Opposites meet, extremes look alike. A top that is not rotating is motionless. The same top at its highest velocity also looks motionless. Lack of light is darkness. Keep on increasing the light, you get a darkness again. A totally sattvic person appears to be very quiet. A totally tamasic one is also quiet. They sound like riddles, but I mean at this point after all the study, it makes sense, no? <laughs> I love how he says, after you've been completely roasted. Roasted. Because <laughs> there's so many things we think, all right, I dropped this habit, I'm doing so good, and then something happens, and you're like, that made me think of like March, how I used to binge, I used to binge eat when, when I lived in the city, and I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I would like, it was horrible. And then I would go run 10 miles. But um, the first thing I did the first two weeks in March, and it wasn't bad, like I didn't eat much, but the first thing I, I did was bake bread. There had to be so much bread baking and like all these carbs ready to go. And it was, I found it really funny, even though I wasn't binge eating. I just had like, you know, whatever, a piece or two, but that's the first thing I did. I had to bake. <laughs> and it's that's like so many years ago that's like 17 years ago that I was dealing with that and yet I guess my little seed is not completely roasted <laughs> yeah it does feel like getting roasted and you have to get roasted you have to die to your previous self to be reborn to who you are that's what Ganesvara talks about this um idea of samadhi as he says you're already in samadhi you, the real you, is always in samadhi. It's just your mind is so in the torrent of the material that you've forgotten. You're so absorbed in this other thing. So I think that's why such a nun is saying, okay, you do these practices, you do them with effort, with effort, with effort, with effort, and then all of a sudden you don't have to apply any more effort. Suddenly you're in samadhi. It's because you were always in samadhi. You're just, you have to dismantle the um, things that were keeping you from experiencing it. So it isn't, I think Jackie always talks about this. Well, if I'm experiencing an effortlessness, right? And you're like, is that not the point? It's like, yes, that is the point, Jackie. Eventually you get to a place where you're experiencing effortless. It's just effortless and there you are. But you gotta get roasted first. <laughs> you gotta walk through fire. Any other thoughts on this? You can unmute yourself if you're. No? 
Okay. Let's do some pranayama. And then we'll move into our meditation practice. You start with some bellows breath. If it's too stimulating for you, if you haven't been doing bellows for a while, you can take alternate nostril instead or just a simple ujjayi breath. We're gonna pump the diaphragm in and out. So there's a focus on the inhalation and a focus on the exhalation. We'll do 30. So you can inhale all the way and exhale all the way. Inhale halfway and then pump the belly in and out for 30. Inhale all the way. Retain the breath, squeeze into the pelvic floor. In case you have abdomen, tuck the chin, turn the eyes up. Exhale all the way up. Inhale halfway and go for 30. All the way. Retain the breath. Exhale all the way up. One more time. Inhale halfway. Inhale all the way. Retain. Exhale all the way. Alternate nostril breathing. Pull the peace fingers into the palm of the right hand. Close off the right nostril with the thumb. Inhale through the left. Close up both, exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close up both, exhale through the left. So you're gonna be working through a couple rounds of that. Everyone's been doing it for a different amount of time. So you're gonna be doing your breath count for a different amount of time. Make sure that the inhale and the exhale are the same count. And exhale, apple left side when you're finished. And you can settle into your meditation or concentration practice. Wherever you're at is fine.
Placing the hands in prayer, bowing the head. Namaste. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much, you too. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.